Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. I'm going to read our text. If you're able to stand in honor of God's word as I do, I would ask you to do that. Allow me to read. We'll pray. We'll get into our study. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Lord God Almighty, we ask that you would bless the preaching and hearing of your word. Dig out our ears to hear the truth and humble our hearts to receive it and to submit in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Well, three Sundays ago, we looked at six reasons to believe from chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Six reasons not to bail. Six blessings which everyone who is justified right now has in Christ. Peace, access, hope, love, deliverance, and reconciliation. And these blessings, we said, bind us to Christ like links in a chain. They are the reasons why the good news is so good. They are why I believe in Christ and why I'm never going back. (laughs) Amen? We've studied in chapters 4 and 5 so far the standing of every Christian as perfectly justified and immutable, meaning that in Christ, our standing before heaven's throne right now is legally and morally perfect. The righteousness of Christ has indeed been imputed to us. We have taken the prince's hand And he has ushered us into the very throne room of the king. In so doing, he has saved us from eternal spiritual death. This is the subject of the remainder of chapter 5. Mankind, we know, has through the ages, at every time and in every culture, believed in varying degrees a works-based righteousness. That they can be saved or forgiven or acquitted or relieved or whatever it may be by what they can accomplish by their own effort. We as a species have believed that our future destiny is determined by our own works. And yet the message of Romans 5 is that access to God, according to chapter 5 and verse 2, is not determined by our own works at all, but by the works of another person. By one person on behalf of everyone else. And the question you may ask is, well, how can the work of one person affect so many people? Certainly, no one is that influential. Now, many of you know that I'm pretty clueless when it comes to social media. I've never had accounts on Facebook. Never. I've never had a Facebook account. I've never been on Instagram. I've never been on Twitter. I've never been on TikTok. I've never had a blog. I have no online following at all. At one point during the COVID lockdown, I was recording sermons and posting them on on YouTube, as you guys remember. But honestly, actually, it was Nathan who was posting all of those videos. As soon as I felt like we could stop posting those videos, guess what? We stopped. I have almost no online presence at all. 
Several years ago, I was walking through downtown Denver with a couple of handsome young Highlanders from the church. We were stopped by a young lady taking a survey on 16th Street Mall. She was very interested in speaking with the two young men I was with. She was much less interested in speaking with me. <laughs> when she heard, however, that I was the pastor of a church, she asked if I was on Facebook or Twitter. I said that I was not. She then proceeded to tell me that I cannot be an influential pastor without social media. And she was bold about it. Now, I disagree, but it did make me curious. Social media does provide a platform to influence others. You ever wondered who the most influential people on the planet are? Can we quantify who has the most influence? Have you ever heard the term social media influencers? The most influential person on the planet, according to followers, is this guy. Cristiano Ronaldo. He's a Portuguese soccer player who has almost a billion followers. A billion. There are a billion people whose phones ding every time this guy posts a picture. Can you, can you fathom that number? That's one in eight people on earth. One in eight. Follow this guy's every move. Lionel Messi, another, follow, another soccer player, has half a billion. So do Selena Gomez, Justin Bieber, Kylie Jenner, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Kim Kardashian. I will brag about the fact that I've heard of half of them. Half a billion followers each of them have. If you've ever wondered, what kind of shoes should I buy? Or where do rich people go on vacation? Or how do celebrities think I should vote? Or, I wonder what brand of oat milk the cool kids are drinking. You can find out on Instagram. <laughs> Follow any one of these people, and they will tell you exactly what brand of oat milk to buy. But what if you wanted answers to life's bigger questions? What about this one? Why do we die? Where do we go when we die? Or, why do we live do our lives matter? Why is there war and crime and poverty and famine and sickness and despair? Who's the biggest influencer when it comes to the tough questions? The answer, Adam. Adam was mankind's first big influencer. But what we have in verses 12 to 14 is almost like his first Instagram post. And everybody followed. You'll notice first in verse 12 that Adam gave us death. And you may say, well, thanks very much. Adam gave us death. Look at verse 12. Therefore, it says, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and death spread to all men because all sinned. Adam sinned. And because all of us were still in Adam when he did, all of us, by extension, sinned. Adam was the prototype. Adam was the prototypical human. He was first made. And church, listen, fresh out of the box, he was perfect. For the first time in my life, for the purpose of studying for this sermon, I went on to Instagram and Facebook and some of these other things and just was looking for some of the most influential people. You would not believe, not believe the number of young men who are on Instagram posting pictures of themselves with no shirts on. I had to search for a picture of a young man with a shirt on. It was, inter it was interesting. I was just thankful that all of the young ladies were wearing shirts. I don't know what you think of. When you imagine the perfect man, but listen, those guys on Instagram who are posting pictures of themselves, bragging about their six packs and other things would be a joke compared to Adam. Every quality attribute that humans possess, our strength, our intelligence, our work ethic, all of it was found perfectly in our first father, Adam. He needed no cosmetic surgery or implants. No steroid injections, no human growth hormone. He was 
perfect. If you're ever looking to be humbled, go order a new pair of glasses. And not only is it an excellent reminder that your eyesight is failing, but when you try the brand new pair of glasses on, you're going to realize that they actually manufacture them crooked. You'll put them on right out of the box and they will sit funny on your face. And so you'll take them to the technician and say, these glasses are crooked. And she will very delicately reply by saying, it's not the glasses. <laughs> my crooked face, along with my bald head and my messed up teeth and my aches and my pains and my groans and my flabby stomach are all a result of Adam's original sin. Because as verse 12 points out, Adam didn't just introduce sin into the human race, that sin brought with it what? Death. Everything that is bad. Death. Notice verse 13. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. And you may think, wait, what? <laughs> the author's argument goes like this. The law given to Moses was dictated by God and inscribed on stone tablets, right? We remember that from Sunday school. The most famous of those laws were the first 10, what are known as the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were given in the year 1400-ish B.C., and so you, well, you may ask, well, then what happened to those people who lived from Adam until Moses, from Adam until that law was given? How can they be judged if they didn't have the law? I one time took my beloved bride to downtown L.A. one day for a date. I parked on the street next to a sign, which probably had very important parking information on it. But that sign was unreadable because someone had stuck a great big stormtrooper head sticker over all of the words. So there was a sign posted, but it just looked like a big stormtrooper head. I parked. We went to dinner. We had a nice time. We walked back to the car. There was a meter maid, and I'm sure that's the wrong term to use. But she was in the process of writing me a ticket. I asked her what I had done wrong. She pointed at the sign and said I was parked illegally. She said, the sign says no parking. And I said, no, it doesn't. That sign says the empire is striking back. <laughs> she didn't smile. She handed me my ticket. Now, here's the point. How can I be expected to obey a law I don't know about? Right? That's the question he's asking in verse 13. How, how can these guys from Adam until Moses, when the law was given, how can they be expected to obey the law? They didn't even have the law. For 2,500 years from Adam to Moses, mankind lived and moved and married and had kids and grew crops and established cities. How could they be expected to know right from wrong if God hadn't given them the parking signs? The author's answer, sin did not suddenly spring up when the law was given. Think about those Ten Commandments. If you had never read them, if you'd never had any exposure to those Ten Commandments, would you still have known that it was wrong to steal? Yes, of course. It's common sense. You don't take other people's stuff. Uh, what about murder? Yes, and guess what? Cultures which don't have the Ten Commandments still outlaw murder. Like, no, you can't do that. But what about committing adultery? Yes, it's wrong. And you know it. There's conviction in your heart. There's a sense of violation there. And even when there was no law, it was still obvious that mankind was sinful. And you may say, well, how was it obvious? And he gives the answer in the next statement, verse 14. Because death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. Death reigned. Did sin suddenly spring up when the law was given? No. The proof that there was sin, even prior to the law, was that every single person that lived prior to the law of Moses eventually what? Died. And death is the result of sin. 
even if you're unclear on the parking rules, but you're receiving parking tickets, you know you must be doing something wrong because of the punishment. Even if I'm unclear about what the sign says, I know that something must be wrong because I keep receiving the punishment. We are reminded that Adam brought death to us all. And death was not natural to mankind. It was not a part of God's design, which is why it hurts so bad. It's not what God had ever intended for us. And so we may pretend for a little while that we are immortal. Like all of those kids on Instagram posting shirtless pictures. The cosmetics, the surgeries, the photo manipulation. We may pretend for a little while that we are never going to grow old and die, but death is both universal and inevitable. As James surely reminds us in his poem, The Contention of Ajax and Ulysses, perhaps you had to read this in like high school literature class. He says this, the glories of our birth and state are shadows, not substantial things. There is no armor against fate, right? You cannot defend against what is inevitable is what he's saying. Death lays his icy hands on kings, scepter and crown must tumble down and in the dust be equal made with the poor crooked scythe and spade. In other words, Every single human, it does not matter who you are or how wealthy you are or how healthy you are, every single human will one day be cut down and buried. The shovel is waiting for all of us. No matter how important or relevant or potent we may feel in the moment, sin has found us right? And because it has, we will one day die. Because of Adam's failure, death has become the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. But praise God, it doesn't end there. Notice the end of verse 14. The sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. Uh, notice that would be bad news if it was a period, but it's not a period. It's a comma who was a type of the one who was to come. Now that statement is great news. By calling Adam a type, the author leaves the door open for redemption. Adam killed us all through sin. He was the world's first influencer, but another is coming who can have the same universal influence. And we're, we're introduced to this second Adam in verse 15. And you'll notice Christ gives us a life. Adam gave us death, but Christ gives us life. And look at verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Death was made inevitable for all men through Adam's sin, but life was made possible for all men through Christ's atoning sacrifice. It is what this same author, the Apostle Paul, described in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22. And he said, nope, one back. There it is. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. It helps us to understand why John 3 is really so important. A Pharisee named Nicodemus came to Jesus at night so as not to be discovered. He had questions about Jesus' teaching. Jesus answered him in chapter 3 and verse 3, truly, truly, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born of the Spirit. You are spiritually dead, and so you must be born again. You must, in order to have this new life, be born into the Spirit. And notice the phrase in verse 15, much more, he says, if many died through one man's trespass, much more has the free gift of grace abounded for many. The effect of Christ's influence is even greater than that of Adam's. The author here gives four ways that Christ's life is greater than Adam's death. Okay? Four ways that Christ's life is greater than Adam's death. And you'll notice first, Christ's life 
abounds more than Adam's death. Meaning the life which Christ offers does not merely restore us to Adam's original state before the fall. Let me say that again. Make sure you hear this. The life which Christ offers does not merely restore us to Adam's original state before the fall. He doesn't just make us like Adam was. It provides the redeemed to share in the very righteousness and glory of God. Adam was sinless, but Adam was not a co-heir with Christ. You hear the difference? What we've been given through Christ, the life that we've been given through Christ is actually greater even than the life that Adam had in the Garden of Eden. What we are saved from, he says, is the ruin of Adam. But what we are saved to is even greater than what Adam had to begin with. John Calvin worded it this way. He said, Christ is much more powerful to save than Adam was to destroy. It's like he's saying you can't even compare the two. How are you going to compare Christ and Adam? The infinite with the finite. What Christ is able to do is so much greater. Adam was able to destroy, but what Christ can rebuild is so much better. We sing the song, Grace, Greater Than All Our Sin. It's one of my favorites. That is a more profound truth than perhaps we even realize. God's grace actually is greater than all of our sin. Notice second, Adam's failure costs. We actually have to pay for Adam's failure. But Christ's life is free. Notice verse 16, the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Did you guys hear how many times free gift, free gift, free gift? The death that Adam offers is the result of his own disobedience, but Christ's life is offered through his own obedience. In other words, the life that we can have through Christ is free. The word grace, its related word gift, both derive from the same Greek word charis. It occurs, that word or derivation of it occurs seven times in these three verses. The translators use both English words, grace and gift, interchangeably, but the reality is the two English words could be smashed together to communicate what charis actually means. The life which Christ offers is a grace gift. It cannot be purchased. It can never be paid back. It's the same word used in Romans 6.23, which we all memorized when we were kids, right? For the wages of sin is death. If you want what is being offered as, as a payment, if you want what you've earned, then you've earned death. That's the paycheck. But the free gift, that's the word, charis. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the question is, do you want what you've earned? Anybody want what you've earned? You guys with me? You all right? Do you want what you've earned? You do? Because what you've earned is what? Death. Or would you rather have what you've been given in Christ? This grace gift. Do you see what he's saying? If you want what you've earned, then you can have what Adam gave. But if you want what cannot be earned, what is given as a free gift, it comes through Jesus Christ. John MacArthur in his commentary on Romans gives two very practical truths, which I think are insightful. Uh, Listen to these and how he juxtaposes them. He says, first, God hates sin so much that it took only one sin to condemn the entire world. God hates sin so much that it took only one sin to condemn the entire world. And honestly, church, it wouldn't have even necessarily mattered which sin was committed. 
Adam's sin was no worse than the numerous sins which you and I commit every day. Any of them would have thrown mankind into condemnation and hell. God's hatred of sin is so severe that any sin ever committed by any man at any time would have been sufficient to damn all of humanity. There is no such thing as a little innocent sin. And that is a sobering truth. But, and here's the second truth, perhaps even more amazing and sobering is this thought, that greater than God's hatred of sin is God's love for the sinner. That is crazy. <laughs> it took only one sin to condemn the entire human race. That is how much God hates sin. And yet God loves the sinner even more than he hates sin. Despite the fact that as a result of that one sin, God condemned the whole human race, his loving grace toward mankind is so great that he provides not only for the redemption of the one man from sin, but for the redemption of all men from all sins. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, Jesus Christ is the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Every single person who repents from their sin can be forgiven. All of them. Every person who confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead will be saved. He is able to forgive every trespass. The blood of Jesus Christ is able to provide redemption for all men from all of their sins. 2 Corinthians 5.19, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Praise God. That'd be a good place for an amen. He doesn't count his tres your trespasses against you. Amen? Here's another one. Just a few verses ago, Romans 4, quoting Psalm 32. Blessed is the one, happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Amen? Amen. amen. Here's another good one. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. What a great way to say that. If your God is God, then be happy. Adam's failure costs. We actually have to pay for it. But Christ's life is free. It is a grace gift, gift given to all who believe. It can't be purchased. It can't be paid back. Doesn't that make you happy? We can truly sing with the hymn writer, my sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but what? The whole, all of it is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. It is well, it is well with my soul. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Adam's costs, Christ is free. Notice third, the essence of Christ's life is greater than that of Adam's death because of how each was achieved. I'll say that again. The essence of Christ's life is greater than that of Adam's death. Because of how each was achieved. In other words, how it was achieved matters. Look at verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. These verses make clear that the essence of Adam's trespass, verse 18, was disobedience, verse 19. The essence of Christ's one act of righteousness, verse 18, was obedience, verse 19. How it was achieved matters. Adam was tested and failed. But Christ's obedience was total. Christ was tested and succeeded. And then, guess what? He was tested again. And he succeeded again. And then, you guys all right? I know it's like four in the morning because of the time change. <laughs> uh, guess what? He was tested again. And he succeeded again. And then again, and he succeeded again, and again, and again, and again, and always faithful obedience. 
Christ's obedience to his heavenly Father is often called active obedience. And that every time Christ was confronted with an opportunity to obey, he did it. Active obedience. On the flip side, every time Christ was presented with an opportunity to disobey, he did not. His death on the cross, for instance, can be called passive obedience. Christ could have avoided that brutal death by simply leaving town. He could have just hidden out at Lazarus' house. They would not have found it. They didn't know where he was. He walked up to Jerusalem knowing that he was going to be handed over and be crucified. And yet he went anyway. Why? Obedience. Christ could have disobeyed, but he didn't. He chose to stay on the path that he knew would lead to his own crucifixion. Passive obedience, both active and passive obedience are included in the statement in verse 18, that one act of righteousness, and in verse 19, one man's obedience. How the gift was obtained matters. Christ perfectly fulfilled the law. He perfectly followed his father's plan. Imagine for a moment that I'm giving a gift to my wife, Hallie. Our next door neighbor, Julie, is an official master gardener. She's gone through whatever process it is, has been judged in all of these things. She is a master gardener. She's got the certificate and the whole thing. What if, as a gift to my wife, Hallie, I went next door and cut all of Julie's tulips and bound them together and handed them to my wife? She would say, well, Danny, thank you for the flowers. She'd be blessed. And then she'd say, where did you get them? And I would say, well, I mowed Julie's yard. (laughs) Something about how the gift was obtained matters, right? Would she be as excited to receive those? No, you stole them. Danny, thank you for the ring. It's beautiful. Where did you get it? Off of some lady's finger. Like, no, the way that it was obtained matters and you can say well what's the difference a ring is a ring flowers are flowers a gift is a gift is it not no (laughs) try it on your wife see how it goes listen the (laughs) sacrifice made for the gift adds to the value of the gift itself the sacrifice made for the gift adds to the value of the gift itself this is why when your little tiny baby grandbaby or or toddler or son or daughter walks up and hands you something that they worked really hard on and it looks by artists standards awful they're horrible artists and yet when they walk up and say daddy i made this for you you hang it up prominently in your office right you put it on your refrigerator because what it took the sacrifice that was made for the gift adds to the value of the gift itself consider the sacrifice of adam Adam sacrificed nothing. He indulged in sin the first opportunity he got to consider the sacrifice of Christ. It cost him everything. The essence is even greater. Notice fourth and and finally, the extent of Christ's life far surpasses the extent of Adam's death. The author ends the section with a declaration of God's grace and specifically two truths regarding its abundance. Notice verse 20. The law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, what's it say? Grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace now reigns through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Lord has a never-ending supply of grace. Some of you maybe have vacationed here. This is Niagara Falls. This is, in fact, just one little tiny piece of Niagara Falls. 755,000 gallons of fresh water fall over the Niagara Falls every second. 755,000 gallons a second. That's 3,160 3, tons of water per second. It's a million bathtubs of water per minute. 
There was a man named Sam Duncannon. He was a simple-minded man. He had very few talents. He used to cut pictures out of magazines and postcards and write captions over them that he thought were appropriate or profound. One day, Sam found a picture of this, Niagara Falls, and he saved it. He waited for a long time, searching for a poem or a stanza which fit. He finally came across a hymn which read this. Have you on the Lord believed? Still there's more to follow. Of his grace have you received. Still there's more to follow. Oh, the grace the Father shows. Still there's more to follow. Freely he his grace bestows. Still there's more to follow. More and more and more and more. Still there's more to follow. On his matchless, boundless love. Still there's more to follow. And Sam Duncannon grabbed his picture of Niagara Falls and wrote across the front, more to follow. When you imagine the grace of God and this saying that it abounds, that it is much more abounding all the more. When you read in verse 21 that sin reigned in death, yes, but now grace reigns through righteousness. Grace is wearing the crown. Think of that. More to follow. Adam's sin and the death that followed are no match for the grace of God. It is immovable. It is unstoppable. Nothing can stand in its way and prevail. And so what do we do with a sermon like this? First, remember, we are no longer under the influence of Adam. Jesus Christ has become our greatest influencer. And because this is true, we should praise God from whom all blessings flow. If you get to the end of this sermon and you're not fired up to worship the name of the Lord, like I got nothing. I don't know what to do. This is it. I mean, this is my best stuff, right? And more important, this is the gospel. As recorded in the scriptures, this is it. Death reigned, grace reigns all the more. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. The chairman of our elder board who is sitting right down here will often ask, are you happy? Somebody should tell your face. <laughs> are you happy? Why would you have a grumpy face if you're in the Lord? That's not saying there's not a season or a time for sorrow. We know the scriptures teach that Ecclesiastes 3 says there is a time for sorrow, that is okay. There is loss and despair and suffering. But happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Because we are not under the influence of the first Adam. Rather, we are under the influence of the second. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And second, develop a deep sense of sorrow over those who are still under death's shadow. And most of us no doubt agree with every theological point in the sermon this morning. We would intellectually nod in agreement with the statement that those who remain under Adam's influence are spiritually dead. Nevertheless, we tend to be in our actions and in our evangelism, we tend to be unconscious universalists. We tend to conveniently neglect the fact that our nice but unbelieving neighbors actually are going to spend eternity apart from the Lord and his grace. Let us not forget that although we are under the influence of the first Adam and because we are, we can be happy. We are surrounded by people. We live in a world full of people who are still conquered by sin and death. And church, this should spur us to evangelism. Lord, thank you for this text, for its truth, Thank you for these people, Lord, so committed to it. I pray, God, that these words would not fall on deaf ears or hard hearts. God, that we would bow the knee to them, be reminded what we've been saved from, and more important, even what we've been saved to, and call our unbelieving family and friends to join us in that joy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.